Here we are at the third to last lecture on uh, thermodynamics. We're going to learn now about phase diagrams, how to read a phase diagram, and also how to interpret a phase diagram using thermodynamics. All right, let's first talk about phase diagrams. What is a phase diagram? Phase diagram is a summary of experimental information. And what we're going to look at is two variables, temperature and pressure. So um, we're going to vary temperature to independent variables, temperature and pressure. And first, let's look at a pure substance. Later on, we'll look at mixtures and phases. But pure substance might be water or carbon dioxide or something like that. And we take that pure substance and we vary the temperature and pressure, various temperatures and pressures, and we figure out what phase it's in. Okay, solid, liquid, or gas, or different solid uh, phases and so on. So for instance, at that particular temperature is a gas. At this particular combination of temperature and pressure is a liquid, and so on. So you just collect some experimental data. And then what you do is plot that data on what's called a phase diagram. Phase diagram has as its two independent variables um, pressure and temperature. And by convention, pressure is on the y-axis and temperature is on the x-axis. And you just sort of plot this. In particular, what you are interested in is phase boundaries. So let's do something like this. So at this particular pressure, as you go along here, you have this would be a solid. And then suddenly you have a phase transition and it goes to a gas. All right. Let's uh, say do it this way. So this is a liquid. So you're up here at this pressure and at this temperature and you start increasing the pressure. Right here at this particular combination of pressure and temperature, you find experimentally that there's a phase change. You can go from a solid to a liquid. And then you keep going, uh, heating the temperature at constant, increasing the temperature at constant pressure. And then right here at this boundary, you'll find a phase transition going from liquid to a gas. So typically phase diagrams are denoted by lines and the lines represent phase boundaries. A little bit before that, a little bit after that. So for instance, let's take a gas at this temperature and pressure, this temperature pressure. Let's increase the pressure at constant temperature. What you'll do is you'll solidify the gas. But if you're out here at this temperature, you have a gas, then you'll go from a gas to a liquid. All right. Um, this usually has some positive slope. A few other points here. Right there at the point where the liquid and the gas and the solid all interact, that's called a triple point. Okay. Triple point means um, you have both solid, liquid, and gas coexisting. So any point along these lines, as you go to this phase through this phase transition, right there on that line, you'll have the two phases coexisting. They're in equilibrium. You have a solid and a gas, for example, here. Or up here, you have a solid and a liquid. For instance, water at one atmosphere pressure and zero uh, Celsius, uh, that will be along a phase diagram because right there, that's the melting point of water or the freezing point of water. So you have two phases coexisting. Right here at the triple point, you have all three phases coexisting. You have a solid, a liquid, and a gas. Uh, it turns out experimentally what you find is a point up here, and this is called the critical point. Right there, the critical point. The critical point means you're out here in a gas. If you increase the pressure, you do not have a phase transition. It doesn't go from a, liquid, from a gas to a liquid. There's no phase boundary above the critical point. Or, for example, you're right here. As you now, at constant pressure, you increase the temperature. There's no phase boundary. The phase boundary actually ends right there, and that's the critical point. Above the critical point, above the critical temperature and pressure, there's no liquid to gas phase boundary. There's still a liquid to solid phase boundary, but up here, no, you get no phase um, change. Uh, so that's a uh, typical, ex um, just 
the points of interest, the solid, the liquid, and the gas phases, the triple point where all three phases coexist, and the critical point at which um, you lose the transition between a gas and a solid. There's no phase transition. Uh, up here, this is called a fluid or a supercritical fluid, meaning you're past the critical point. Well, you didn't have a phase diagram. It's a very, it's like a dense gas called a fluid. All right, now let's introduce the concept of, let's see, have we done that? Yeah, so let's look at a single component, summarize phase infinity. Let's look at this, degrees of freedom. Well, they're reduced at lines and points in the phase diagram, but let's talk about degrees of freedom. All right, so in this phase diagram, or when you're doing the experiment, we have two degrees of freedom. We can independently specify temperature and pressure. So in general, <laughs> I can't spell general, in general for a pure substance, you have two degrees of freedom. All right. So that means you can independently specify the two degrees of freedom are pressure and temperature. So that's fine. Now, uh, and we're, yeah, so now what we're going to consider is what happens if you want uh, phase equilibrium. This will reduce the degrees of freedom to one. Why is that? Well, let's look at here. Here's our two independent variables. We can independently measure uh, vary pressure and temperature. And let's say this is a phase boundary. Here you have, um, say, a um, what's this called? Uh, a, a, a solid, and this is the gas. Now, suppose that your restriction is you want to face equilibrium. Suppose you want solid and gas to be in uh, equilibrium. In other words, no matter what the pressure and temperature is, you want both to be there. So, let's say we'll start here. If we change the temperature, that means the pressure has to be up here in order to go along this line. Suppose we change the pressure. In order to have this phase equilibrium, we have to have this temperature. So by specifying this constraint that solid and gas phases have to be in equilibrium, we really only have one degree of freedom. Because if we specify a temperature, we have to be uh, at a particular pressure. Or if we specify a pressure, we have to be at a particular um, temperature because we have to be along this line here. It generally can be anywhere along here, so we have two degrees of freedom, but now we're forced to go along a line. This is a plane, okay, two degrees of freedom. A line really only has one degree of freedom back and forth. Okay, so that's degrees of freedom. Now let's go, say, to a triple point. Okay, so here we have our pressure and temperature, and here's our triple point right there. And to get the triple point, we want uh, the uh, two fa uh, sorry, three phases to coexist, or three phases to be in equilibrium, all at the same time. So along these lines, in the previous case, we just had two phases, but now three phases. This implies we have zero degrees of freedom. Why? Because that's the only point. The only point on the phase diagram which satisfies this constraint that the three, three phases coexist. So we have two degrees of freedom. We specify one constraint. We have one degree of freedom. We specify two phases of equilibrium. We have zero degrees of freedom. Okay. Um, in three dimensions, for example, I don't know if you ever flew a plane, but plane has pitch, roll, and yaw. Those are the three degrees of freedom for an airplane corresponding to the three dimensions, up, down, left, right, and uh, side to side. All right. So I think, well, I hope that you uh, ha have now some understanding of what degrees of freedom are. So 
you reduce the degrees of freedom to one on a phase diagram of a pure substance when you specify that two phases have to coexist and you reduce the uh, degrees of freedom to zero when you specify that three phases have to coexist. All right, phase diagrams. Now let's look at some prototypical phase diagrams. The one, the two that people always use are carbon dioxide and water. So let's look at water first. This is from a Wikipedia article. The blue phases here, or the blue area, is where the water is a solid. The sort of orangish yellow is where the water is a vapor. And the green is where the water is um, a liquid. All right, here's the uh, critical point of water where all three phases coexist, the solid, the liquid, and the gas. That's at uh, zero Kelvin and um, at a high, uh, um, sorry, lower, what's this, pressure? 611, so lower, a little lower pressure than one atmosphere. One atmosphere in SI units is 100 kilopascal, about. See, 101.65. Okay, so there, that's the um, atmospheric pressure. So the triple point of water is zero Celsius, but lower temperature than atmospheric pressure. So you want all three phases of water to coexist there. Uh, at one atmosphere pressure, that's that line here. This is the melting point of water at zero Celsius, right there. And keeping it at one atmosphere, at 100 degrees Celsius, we have now the boiling point. So this is called a normal boiling point. It's the point, it's the point at which, at one atmosphere, there's a phase change from liquid to uh, gas or gas to liquid. And this would be the normal freezing point at one atmosphere, the temperature at which uh, you have the solid liquid phase equilibrium. The critical point of water is way up here. Uh, note that this is a logarithmic scale so it's about uh, a thousand times, let's see, one ten, ten to a thousand times higher pressure than, um, than atmospheric pressure, the critical point of water uh, way over here, and it's uh, at 350 C. So above this temperature, you do not have that phase transition. And finally, you might notice that there are other phases of solid. So solid just doesn't have a single, of water, doesn't just have a single solid phase. There's other phases. This phase is called IH. That's the normal thing when you think about ice, when you put ice in drinks and so on. But there's an IC phase. There's a phase called uh, 11 and so on. So you can have phase transitions, solid, solid phase transitions here. Solid, solid phase transitions. For those of you who are um, interested in uh, Kurt Vonnegut's stories, this is uh, one of his stories of, uh, sorry, a Cat's Cradle. And this is Ice-9. So he postulated in Cat's Cradle, or actually said that there was a form of ice, Ice-9, that was thermodynamically more stable than liquid water. So if a little bit of this got out and got into, say, the world, the whole world at room temperature would, uh, the water in the world would change to ice. Ice 9 does exist, but it does not have the properties that were described by Vonnegut in his novel Cat's Cradle. All right, uh, another interesting point, and maybe you, guess, you can't really see this, but if you would blow this up, this has a negative slope. So the phase transition line between solid and liquid has a negative slope for water. What does that mean? Well, normally you think of a liquid, and if you increase the, the uh, pressure on a liquid at constant temperature, you would think, well, I'm forcing those things together, and then the liquid would change into a solid. But water is different. If you put additional pressure on a solid, you would think it would remain a solid, but no, it becomes a liquid. So that solid compressed in this region here becomes a liquid. That's interesting. And I guess that's it for the phase diagram of water. Let's look at the second one, the phase diagram of um, carbon dioxide. So this is CO2. All right, just take a look here. Uh, we have the liquid, the gas, and the solid. Probably some other forms of solid, but we just lump them all together here. There's the triple point of carbon dioxide. This is the point at which solid, 
liquid and gas completely coexist. It has a degrees of freedom of zero. Here's a solid liquid line and here's a liquid vapor line and right there is a critical point of carbon dioxide. What's interesting about the critical point of carbon dioxide is that it's around 300 C as opposed to, um, or sorry, 300 Kelvin. This is now the temperature scales in Kelvin. So this is around room temperature. Oh, that's kind of cool. And the pressure here is, well, not, um, not too bad. This is uh, one bar here. Uh, so you have to go about 100 times one bar there. So that's uh, around one, atmos one atmosphere. You go to about 100 uh, times atmospheric pressure, you get the critical point. So if you raise, if you go a little bit above 300 K, you go here, you go into the regime as you start compressing gaseous carbon dioxide, you go in the regime of what's called a supercritical fluid and you get supercritical carbon dioxide because you're above the critical uh, pressure. Supercritical carbon dioxide is a good cleaning fluid. In fact, uh, some uh, people propose instead of using toxic chemicals to do dry cleaning, why not use supercritical carbon dioxide? And also, if you're into decaf coffee, supercritical carbon dioxide is a good way to remove caffeine from coffee beans. Um, and so when you look at um, you know, various ways of taking out caffeine from coffee, one of them is called you know, using the, the natural effervescence of something or other. What they're using is supercritical carbon dioxide to remove caffeine. All right, so that's it for uh, carbon dioxide. And I guess that's it for this particular part of lecture 10. The next lecture we'll talk about phase thermodynamics.